Hello, and let's talk about the minimum support price or the MSP. So the MSP has been very much in the news over the past few days as the farmers have made it one of their key demands. Now, the important thing to note here is what the farmers mean by the MSP and what the government means are two very different things. The farmers, of course, seeking a much more higher MSP based on very scientific calculations, whereas the government has been talking about just keeping the status quo. Now, it's important to remember that many farmers across India do not get MSP. And this, in fact, has been used by some of the supporters of the government to say that it's not really that big a deal and therefore the reforms are okay. However, what we do know is that the MSP has a lot of benefits, both direct and indirect, for both farmers who get it and those who do not get it as a larger ecosystem as well. And all this could be destroyed if corporates are allowed to have a bigger say in agriculture. We talked to senior journalist Aranjay Chakravarti on some of these issues. Thank you so much, Aranjay, for joining us. So the farmers' protest has entered its third week and the government uh, has been negotiating or claims it has been negotiating, of course, but offering, in fact, very little concrete steps considering what the farmers have been asking. As Anand Mulla was yes. pointing out, they have been saying amendment, amendment, amendment. We have been saying repeal, repeal, repeal. But one key aspect, like we talked about last week, remains the MSP. It's one of the central issues. Yeah. And uh, farmers leaders have pointed out, the uh, other day you were talking to Vijay Krishnan, uh, recently you were talking to Sainath, both of them pointing out that the MSP is, of course, part of the issue, but the larger demand is that they want uh, a complete withdrawal of the laws because just a guarantee of the MSP alone does not necessarily work. But in this context, I also wanted to maybe talk to you a bit about how the MSP actually does work, because there has been, of course, a lot of, uh, say, questions around the MSP, people saying, of course, that, you know, uh, this is maybe not that modern a system, we should go for a more privatized system where there's choice, you know, yeah. this regulated system is not really the way ahead. So uh, maybe at the level of maybe an explainer or at a very basic level, why is the MSP so central? So, you know, one of the arguments that is constantly made, Prashant, is that uh, the MSP, I think the Shanta Kumar committee, the BJP's uh, Shanta Kumar, had uh, uh, done a report for the FCI, which came out, and this he calculated that about 6% of paddy and wheat farmers in, Del mm -hmm. in India mm -hmm. end up getting MSP. And even yeah. there, only 25% or a quarter of their produce is actually picked up at MSP, which is what the government announces as a support price. Uh, Harish Damodaran recently in uh, Indian Express calculated and showed that that is not correct. It's an underestimate. So he suggested that maybe about 15 to 20% of uh, uh, agricultural producers do get MSP, do uh, get advantage of MSP in some sort or the other. And uh, then there are other products like milk and cotton, etc. cotton, which is picked up at MSP and milk, where there is a, some sort of a guaranteed uh, minimum threshold that farmers, cooperative farmers get. And even the cooperatives of cooperatives, that is a de facto government supported system that we see, Amul, Mother Dairy and stuff like that. Um, so Harish Dharmodharan argues that about 25% of people who work within the larger uh, process of cultivation and poultry and dairy farming get MSP. We, so the government's argument has been uh, that, uh, well, you know, even if that's the case, then 75% don't get it. So what's the big problem if we exactly. remove MSP? Right. Only the cream, the rich farmers have been getting MSP and they are the people who are worried about it. They are the people who have vested interests and that is why they want this MSP system because they corner all the um, all the uh, subsidies that the government gives to the agricultural sector. And they don't want that to go away. If these laws are changed, then you know what will happen is that uh, corporate sector will enter, yeah. people will compete, there'll be no monopoly. Mm -hmm. Right now there's a Mandi monopoly, there would be no monopoly and they would fight and the farmer would sit at his, you know, in his farm, <laughs> on his smoking perch. his beady, <laughs> yeah. And yeah. On his perch, smoking his beady, lying back. And maybe because of the entire privatization system, obviously he would no longer need BD. He'll be smoking high quality cig cigarettes because you know they have so much money. But uh, of course, this is not a. Uh, I don't smoke. Let me tell you, I cannot. Uh, we don't endorse for, it officially. I do not. <laughs> yeah, and I cannot vouch for the bearded gentleman you're seeing on the screen right now. But <laughs> let me tell you that the point here remains that. Uh, uh, the uh, the picture that is painted is, of course, that these 
buyers will come and say, buy from me, buy, I'll buy, I'll buy, please sell it to me. Here, take as much as you want. Now we know that this is all a fairy tale. It's a ridiculous fairy tale, which is not taking place anywhere in the world. When you remove the standard systems of procurement and allow big corporates to come in, what happens is what is called a monopsony. A single buyer takes over, right? Uh, we know that is what uh, perhaps everyone's waiting for in the first place, right? right. And uh, this entire fairy tale is even more a fairy tale, Prashant, because agriculture is not like factory production. It's as simple as that. So if you, let's say you are, you run a factory which makes, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe table lamps, right? And then you get to know that another factory has opened up of table lamps and you say that, okay, now this is a problem. So I'll have to put down, push down my prices because there's, suddenly there's a supply going to increase. So uh, let's not produce as many as we produced last season, right? Let's reduce the supply so that we can hold our prices, right? and retain the same revenue, even with the same amount of supply, a lower amount of supply. Right. And a farmer can't do that. A farmer's uh, response is always to the previous season. Right. Even if uh, the government says, you know, big corporates will come in, they'll have these AI and computer linkages across the world. They will know which part of Burkina Faso is short of maize. And they'll tell the uh, farmer in Sasaram to grow maize and sell it. These are, these are all pipe dreams, first of all. However, the bigger point is the farmer will still have to commit to something at the beginning of the season, at the beginning of the sowing season, right? And then you wait for weeks for that uh, crop to grow. And when, by the time you grow, it's only then that you realize whether there's a shortage or a glut. It's only then you realize what the demand is for product. This is very different from manufacturing, where if you produce table lamps, you can sell them next year. Just hire a go down and keep it there. Farmers do not have access to that. Right. So given that this entire thing of market forces, demand and supply matching is poppycock. Right? Mm -hmm. It is absolute. These are white lies. I don't think anyone believes them. Those who say all this are essentially apologists for big corporates. Let us be very clear about it. Mm -hmm. They're liars. I'm sorry to make these big statements because they know it's not true. It's not true anywhere in the world. It doesn't happen, right? Uh, now the point is that secondly, the entire process of um, uh, once the farmer is committed and we know what happens, the only crops where despite a shortage of production or a glut of production, farmers can still get some sort of stable prices are wheat and rice, which the government procures, right? So therefore any other crop, even oil seeds and cotton, even cotton, we know that even in cotton, what happens is that the government doesn't procure enough. Farmers are left with huge amounts of produce and they, uh, of the crop and they sit around. They just say, do distress sales. There was a time before the, you know, the boom years, what would happen is these Chinese traders would be all over Gujarat picking up buying cotton. And you would say, wow, privatization has completely given up the need for government to procure. But as soon as that boom was over, when that 2008 collapse happened, that is all gone. Right. It happens in some years when the demand pushes up and there's a shortfall in some other part of the world and Chinese traders come and buy it. But otherwise that demand, it has been shrinking. And unless the government buys these products, no one else is going to, when there is a glut, where there's overproduction. We know what that does to vegetables. Vegetables, for exactly. Huh? Right? Right. And the funny thing is that when that happens and we say, oh my God, look at these middlemen, they're making all the money. And that is why APMC and MSP, all this should be stopped. We talk about all this when they, we talk about onions and tomatoes, as if yes. the government has been procuring okay. onions and tomatoes. Exactly. As if it has been announcing MSP for onions and tomatoes. Right, right, right. right? Absolutely. So we see images of tomato being thrown on yeah. the roads, we see news clippings because uh, uh, farmer organizations are pretty smart. They also call up news agencies and say, we're going to throw tomatoes, please send a camera or crew. And they uh, protest in that fashion. Exactly. So it's right. only MSP which protects them. Absolutely. Now, as I think we've discussed this in the past as well, uh, Prashant, and I'm going to just quickly go through that as well. 
And you know, when I say quickly, it's usually <laughs> half quick, but <laughs> bear with me. But what I'm saying is that, okay, let's say the 75% of farmers do not get MSP, hmm. right? Cotton and paddy farmers do not get it. I'm sorry, uh, all, all farmers. We know that about 35, 50% of the produce, 40 to 50% of the pr produce is picked up, but a large part of that produce might be, uh, you know, owned by or being sold by large farmers, not necessarily representative to numbers there. But uh, let's say that 75% don't get it. They're still protected by the MSP. Mm -hmm. And this is where it is a crucial thing to understand. And, uh, you know, I have a friend who comes from Madhya Pradesh, hails from Madhya Pradesh, and uh, his family is an Arthia family. Right. They're big traders. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the reasons, so I uh, asked him that, how does this system work? Why are, what is your problem with uh, MSP? So he said that we don't have any fields, but the mm -hmm. point is MSP is our insurance. Right. Because we pay close to MSP to even the small farmer. Mm -hmm. So if we are, let's say, getting a thousand rupees, we'll end up paying 850. Our margin is 150, which then includes cost of storage, transport, the financing, because we will be holding till the government procures. Right. A lot of times we know that things being produced in Bihar are being bought by traders and taken to Punjab, Haryana, where the mandis have a decent procurement uh, system. Absolutely. Right? That is where it is picked up. So the fact that the government ensures a minimum support, right, is that even if prices fall, even Arthias can pay a steady exploitative, but steady amount to small farmers. This is something that is not, I'm sure everyone knows, but it's not talked about. Because the Arthias are exploitative, but as in all pre-capitalist exploitative relationship, there is a community tie. Right? Mm. They're not confronting each other as independent, impersonal entities. Right? And those community ties have to be reproduced over a time. If you let a farmer die, then the chances are that, that you will die in the end, right? Because your entire catchment area will go. Right. So as it would be wrong to call it feudal, therefore I'm calling it non-capitalist uh, relations, all right? There are those community ties which ensure and endure, which is why often farmers commit suicide when banks or microfinance entities uh, come to take back their money. It's not always that it's a local Mahajan who's asking for the money. Right. It's often it's an institutional framework which comes, an impersonal institutional framework which comes to take the money back. And because they've not been able to access MSP, because if they could access MSP, if they could ac access procurement, they would not be in this trouble. Absolutely right. And, and this context is yeah. sorry. And this context no, no, no. is it's interesting that uh, like you talked about these uh, relations and community. And uh, while we do accept that uh, there is, of course, definitely exploitation, the solution yes. to this exploitation, of course, would have been for the state to strongly intervene, create community exactly. networks, you know, bring farmers together and break whatever uh, exploitative relations are there in that way, as opposed to actually abandoning the entire sector to another fresh player, which is actually even far more powerful than your local uh, exploitative moneylender. Look at the insidious manner in which it is being done. Because the point is not that they're just saying that, okay, we want to in end this exploitative relationship. We want mm -hmm. to break the back of the Arathias and the uh, middlemen. We want to ensure farmers get full price. But MSP doesn't work. We think private sector will pay more. Right? Let's assume that is their belief. Because uh, many people don't, the people don't, uh, there's a large number, the majority of those who do economic analysis or economic policy are essentially neoliberal influenced people. So they believe in the market. It's not as if they're, they're you know, chores, right? Some of them are, I'm not saying all of them are not, but some of them are, but still they believe it. So let's say they believe that farmers will get, but then tell me one thing, why does the government put in those two new laws for contracts which says that the contract will be on predetermined produce and I think quality, right, standards. And also that uh, both parties can dissolve this contract anytime they want, right? right? And uh, the other side, other part is that 
any dispute, you can't go to civil court. You can only go to the SDM's tribunal. Okay. This is essentially allowing the executive to decide. There's more in this. There is no leeway for the states to do anything because in both the laws, it says that the center can direct states to do and follow these laws, right? Implement them. The center has the right. So essentially the federal rights are completely being taken away. Absolutely. Why are these laws there that you cannot go to a court? Why is there a law which uh, makes it so easy to create contracts for the buyer and uh, you know, a farmer, are they, is this an equal relationship? Does the government of India really want us to believe that there's an equal relationship between a big corporate with its army or big lawyers and a small farmer? And it's a joke if they want. So if they were serious about it, they would have strengthened the legal protection for farmers. They would have said there'll be a fine for big corporates if they violate mm. corporate norms, right? A big corporate will have to pay everything in advance. Contracts can be changed by farmers, but make it much more difficult for the buyer to change it. No, all of these have been tweaked to exploit farmers more, bring them within exploitative capitalist relationships. Absolutely. Now, again, I'm not saying that the pre-capitals or the non-capitalist relationships are not exploitative. We know they are. No one's batting for Arthias here. But the point is that the Arthias system has actually been sustained by the state itself. The state ensured, because we know that when there was a shortage right after uh, independence, Nehru had supposedly said that uh, one of, uh, we should hang these hmm. uh, you know, trade merchants from the nearest lamppost, something like that. You know, there's this uh, right. apocryphal story, which huh. supposedly is true. Uh, and then this entire system was brought that all produce needs to pass through these government regulated markets. One, so that the government knows how much is being produced and also so that it can ensure that farmers get, they can track what farmers are being paid. Right. So that the, the level of exploitation can reduce. Mm -hmm. And the government understood that you cannot suddenly overnight change these relationships. So the state has to support right. it with money, with its institutional structure mm -hmm. to reduce the exploitation. Right. Right? Now you're essentially opening it up to increase the exploitation. Not reduce it. Absolutely. And uh, Anandya, finally, in this context, just a quick <clears throat> reflection also on the state of the narrative, <clears throat> state of the discourse, so to speak, around this whole issue. What yeah. you're basically seeing also is the fact that uh, a series of values and ideas starting from the mid 80s, the early 90s, that have become so seeped in into our lives, into our culture, that in the absence of, I mean, without really looking at some of the realities you were talking about, some of the yeah. details we're talking about, words like choice and freedom and yeah. the flexibility, all mm. these are, so become such a religion for many, both in the middle class, of course, but also in the media, which is why yes. they keep getting repeated and which helps just create this whole narrative of the government being willing to compromise, the government mm. being the almost helpless party in this scenario where they're just somehow trying to negotiate with the farmers. So that way we're actually in quite sad times considering if hundreds and thousands of people being on the borders is not enough to really shake, to wake you up and make you see reality, then we're really in sad times. Absolutely, Prashant. The point is that very clear that the media and again, uh, there are both kinds of people here. Yeah? Those who have been trained and, um, you know, for 35 years, you've been trained. So even a 45 year old person is, was 10 at that time would have no idea. Someone who was 15 is 50 today on the, in the, la, in the senior most level in news organizations, probably most of them are not there at that level. Uh, so uh, if your training for 35 years has been this, that this is good, right? There are, uh, then it's automatically true that you will say, well, you know, yes, there are problems, but those problems can be solved with farmers these are rich farmers. Right? They get subsidies. We need to stop all this. Right? And why are poor farmers not raising, uh, not protesting? Right? As if, if poor farmers protested in their village, you will send a camera crew to cover it. Exactly. Right? As if you've been covering poor farmers every day to know what they do and whether they protest. Right? 
And also when they protest, what happens? You call them Naxalite, Khalistani, anti-national. You say these are Pakistani and Chinese-backed, choreographed movement. So who's going to protest, first of all? As a poor farmer has time to get away from the act of just about earning a living every single day right. and come to you, uh, come and protest. So these are all uh, a combination of a mindset and deliberate choice. I don't think it is just mindset. It is these people who say there is full, their capitalism and the market allows full choice sitting in these so-called private uh, networks, which are supposedly emerged out of capitalism and the market, they have no choice. They cannot sit in their studios and say this is wrong because they do not have the choice to do that. Right. If they say it, they will not be in the studio the next day. And they know it. They know they have no choice. They know that they're not being allowed to speak on social media. Their organizations are telling them that you can't. So they are very well aware of what capital and market does to democracy and choice, but they are not going to, uh, so they know all these things. They know these things. Many people, and the sad part is that despite this knowledge, they don't question what they've been taught. That's the problem. Absolutely. Thank you so much for talking to us. Thanks a lot. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back on Monday with more news from India and the world. Until then, keep watching News Click. Thank <laughs> you.